Here from Motorcycle MD. Welcome to Ask MD Live, episode 18. Now, I'm running a little bit late. Got my dog with me. As you can see, he's the most scaredest dog I've ever seen. Scared of everything. But, Z, he's a good dog. And I'm on. Uh, babysitting duty tonight with him. So tonight, as usual, we'll be going over a couple questions from my email subscriber list. They input questions from there. Um, you can go to the website motorcyclemd.com. There's an Ask MD drop down. You can fill out a little questionnaire, and we go over some uh, hot questions that I get throughout the week. Now. I don't know if you saw last week's, or actually, I just posted a video um, on testing switches. I hope you guys enjoyed that video. If not, check it out. It's pretty cool. But the last Monday, I talked about um, a huge announcement, and I'm going to push it again to this week as far as, I mean, for the next month or so. But um, uh, I'm really excited about it. I'm building a membership uh, site or a course for memberships only and uh, it's gonna be really awesome I'm working out a bunch of series of videos that I'm gonna go through with like electrical and um, wiring schematics and you know just throughout the months just nail down a bunch of awesome topics um, solely for members so there'll also be all the carburetor videos that I've been doing on inline fours and V twins and singles and dirt bikes and scooters I mean just I'm building an encyclopedia of all carburetor cleans professionally I can go step by step and I walk you through separation, you know, and polishing, cleaning, and just make sure that everything is perfect. Those will all be available on that course. So if you want to know more information about that, just join the mailing list. I'll be sending out emails soon. Um, and I'll also be giving a discount, you know, to a lot of our, a really cool treat to all of the uh, people who have been with me so long and on that email list. So. Um, I hope no one else is getting a lag. It might just be me stuttering because I, I have an awesome speech impediment. But what's going on, Eric? So I'm, I'm going to pull up the feed on my computer. And then at, and once, I, once I go through the questions, which I, I think we only have three tonight, so, something like that. And um, I'll open the floor up to some questions uh, that you guys may have about your own motorcycle. We can maybe nail on them right then and there. Um, Two days ago, I woke up with a sore throat, so I'm super pumped about that. Um, but so I got some coffee and honey that I'm drinking to stay awake and hopefully soothe my throat. But let's pull up the live feed here so I can see what you guys are talking about. Again, just put a quick video out on, t or not quick, it's like 20 minutes long. I know all my, all my videos are freaking long. I don't know why. I just want to give so much information and without killing people's time, but oh well. Um, so tonight's, you know, the uh, topic or the um, header text. What's a ground? There's a question in here that we're, we're going to go over. It's it, it's a pretty straightforward question, but I wanted to hit on what a ground actually is. It's not you know it's not some big elaborate topic, but what you what you got to relate it to is your battery okay you have a positive side and a negative side of the battery negative being the ground side of the battery so a ground is anything that associates with that negative side of the battery the battery is directly connected to, to the frame or the engine by a cable so everything metal that's not rubber mounted on the on your motorcycle is grounded okay Remember what I said, everything that is metal that is not rubber mounted is a ground. So, your exhaust, your motor, um, in some cases your handlebars, um, you know, hardware that's, that's holding everything together that's not rubber mounted is a ground. It's all feeding back to that negative side of the battery and it's called a ground. So whenever someone says, what, do you have a ground there, or is it, is it a bad ground, or is it making a connection to ground, something like that. It's all saying, in whatever series or circuit it's involved in, the switch or the light or whatever, is it making a connection somehow back to that negative side of the battery? Not going straight to the battery, 
You know, it's whatever's going to metal piece that is connected to that ground, which is grounded by a big metal, like zero gauge wire. Um, so that's just a, a really, really brief, you know, what what a ground is, but it's not, don't overcomplicate it. A ground is anything that is associated with the negative side of the battery. Okay, so if it's making a bad ground, if something ha has a bad wire or a, um, a bad ground wire or a dirty ground, you can take that same wire or that same, whatever that switch or contact or bulb needs as far as the ground goes, and you can go to the ground with a jumper wire. As long as it's not, as long as you're not doing it b before a load, that can get kind of confusing. I'll, I'll, again, in the membership thing, I'm gonna do a full series on wiring and schematics and all that stuff, but you get the idea, okay? So, let's dive into some questions before I talk myself into a circle. Um, let's see, question number one. This is from Neil in Canada. He's got a 2000 CBR 600 F4. I'll tell you what, man. This month alone, I've probably dealt with at least six or seven 600 F4s. No joke. Literally 2000 CBR 600 F4s. I got carbs behind this bike. This is a gorgeous Magna, by the way. I mean, just so many 600 stuff's been popping up this month. It's just weird how it all kind of, everything comes at once and it's usually like the same brand or the same model. Um, bike is, so he's got, he's got a lot of mods on it. He's got some, a shorty exhaust, um, all the necessary carb mods, jetting, needles, mixture screws, super cleaned, as you say, um, K and air filter. The bike so far is running great. It's more of a can I do it question, or should I? I'm getting rid of the, of the mile of wasted rubber tubing under the tank. Got, I'm sorry, I was just thinking in my head. Got, got rid of the direct air induction valve as well. Float and vacuum chamber air vents go directly into the air box. All those open holes in the, in the box need to be filled somehow. I did leave the pair valve and the vacuum connected. My question is, I'm not venting dirty crankcase fumes through the air box and carbs anymore. Can I run the crankcase vent tube into the pair valve where the air supply hose for the system used to go? I th I'm thinking this should suck out the crankcase. This should suck out of the crankcase. Will it work leaving the vacuum on the valve or blocking that off? Okay, so that's two questions, I guess. Great channel, by the way. Keep up the awesome information. I'm glad I've come across it. So, Neil. Um, I would advise you not to do that. Um, if you were going to do it, you would need the vacuum on the pair check valve. Okay, you wouldn't cap it off. The, the, the thing with that pair check valve is, I think I actually have one, hold on. I should probably be more prepared. So a pair check valve is usually looks something like this. All right, so you got a vacuum right here and there's a diaphragm inside of here. So you got, you know, different pair going to the front of the head or the back of the head and you got a main feed going to either the air box or something like that. But this top one is operated by a vacuum off of the intake and it functions a diaphragm inside opening and closing it okay so his idea is that if he leaves the vacuum on here and hooks the crankcase breather system up up to the pair valve that normally routes the air box that the vacuum will suck it out but that would be putting a negative vacuum on the motor and the thing is inside of this pair valve neil there's like metal parts there's like a spring and a what man What's up, bro? And um, a diaphragm. So if you were to suck that moisture from, from the crankcase, which is like watery, oily, nasty substance, A, it's gonna ruin the pair valve because that, that's not what it's for. 
Um, as soon as moisture gets inside of those and start to rust them, that's when they start going bad. And oftentimes, side note, on the like 1100, um, VT1100, or on some VTX1300s, or some VT750s, they use that same operating system. And there's been a couple cases where people will put, you know, they'll put some kind of aftermarket air filter on there, or um, the bike's outside in the water, or in the elements for long periods of time. And they, they develop vacuum leaks there, and then that fills with moisture. And what happens is when they're riding, and you, you're coming down off D-cell, and right at the very, very end, you'll get one loud bang. It's a loud pop, that actually hurt my throat. One loud pop right at the end. It's not just like a, a steady D-cell back, deceleration backfire, like pop, 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 pop. It's just one loud, like someone just fired a shotgun by your ear. Um, and that's having to do with that pair valve failing, or there's some kind of crazy rich issue going on. Like I just fixed one on a uh, uh, VT1100 over there. See the one, the one with the high handlebars? See the same issue. Right towards the end, boom, it would fire. Now there's usually like three things that, that can go wrong. The pair check valve, this, going bad. That one does not have one on that model. Or, like I said, you have some kind of rich issue. And the, his rich issue, issue was they have a... Uh, plunger style, so like an originator valve for the choke, looks kind of like this. Some of you guys may not have ever seen this, but some of you have. So let me put it all together. So there's a choke cable that runs into here, and then you have this originator valve, like a choke, that goes straight into the side of the carb body. And what it does is when, when you pull the choke, why are you laying on the cement, man, not on the rug? loser you pull the choke cable and it pulls this plunger back all the way inside the body but what happens is where this black plastic fitting fits into the carb body this little rubber elbow actually plays a huge role because once these rip like this where it leaves that lipped part on see that this is actually supposed to be on there like that once this rips, this joint then comes and separates from that choke plastic piece and kind of lays off to the side. And what that does is that's pulling this enrichner valve, sucking it all the way inside the body and just letting it sit there. So it's just running extremely rich. And on his case, it was the front cylinder. And just from visual inspection, trying to figure it all out, that's what I saw. This was just kind of hanging out, kind of locked like that. And that choke was like, it's, it's as if you're riding around with choke all day long. And it will foul the plugs out and do a symptom like that, which is that one loud backfire. Anyways, that was a huge rant. Um, I'm worried about you using vacuum to suck crankcase pressure out. That's not what it's designed to do. Um, if anything, you can uh, find a way to like cap it and then drain it every now and then into like a, you know... Um, carton of milk or something, just something that you can dispose of properly. Um, I'm not gonna say leave it open and let it run on, run on the ground because you shouldn't be doing that, but that's a way that, that you can route that. I would not use a pair check valve system to do that, all right? Question number two, John from Sweden. I guess that's how you say it in Swedish, Swedish, Sweden. 85 Honda V65. So he's dealing with the diaphragms on the carbs. So the, the vacuum slide pistons. And a lot of times you can't find those anymore from Honda. Um, or you find a way to just get the rubber diaphragm, which many people do. Um, so what he's doing is he's saying, hey, my friend, hope you're doing well. I see a lot of YouTube videos about changing the diaphragms, breaking away the plastic ring and glue, and adding, adding that new diaphragm on the slider. In my case, the diaphragm is also put between the slider's shoulder, 
and a yellow plastic ring. I did not remove the plastic ring yet because the diaphragms I bought are easily put back into the slider with a little soapy water and a credit card, pushing it back in gently between the slider's shoulder and the plastic ring and move around a little so it seats. Well, and it seems okay to me. Question is, is it really necessary to break away the plastic ring and glue the, the diaphragm onto the slider as shown in the videos? Did I buy the wrong diaphragms? How big is the ring on a vacuum leakage? Oh wait, how big is the risk on a vacuum leakage? In other words, do I have the glue, do I have to, do I have to glue the new ones? Again, I feel no difference between the old diaphragm and the new one when they are in the slider. So, um, I wouldn't glue it personally. That's not something that I, that I like doing is, is fixing something by gluing it. But what I would try to do is to separate the plastic ring as much as you can and not breaking it off and try to get it into that shoulder. Okay, if you feel like you are confident that that diaphragm, that new diaphragm that you're going around that plastic ring in the center is in there with the soapy water and the credit card trick, man, I, I, would, I would go for it. I would go, I mean, if it looks even and it's not, you know, pulling out very easily, um, maybe install it in the car and function that diaphragm, you know, 200 times and see, uh, and take it back off and see, you know, did it respond well? Um, kind of put a lot of pressure on it and see if you can get it to malfunction. Um, that's what I would say. Um, I wouldn't glue anything though because I have a feeling that might um, put you in a worse scenario than you want to be in just in case something goes wrong or you have to, it, you know, it hardens the rubber and it causes one side of the diaphragm to kind of flex more than the other. I, I wouldn't mess with any of that. Do the best you can with the credit card trick and see if that works. Um, hope, hope the best for you, man. So this brings us to our last question. No, it's not our last question. It's our third question. Yeah, and I, I have one more. Um, Zach from Spokane, Washington. 85 Honda Shadow VT700. Love your channel, man. I removed the carbs, took them apart, and cleaned them all out before I saw your channel. I didn't know you were supposed to soak the carbs and therefore I did not soak the carbs. But I did spray carb cleaner in all the areas and passages and use compressed air to blow it out and clear the passages. When I put them back onto the bike, it ran better than it, it had ever than it ever had. However, that's not much to say. That's not saying much. I'm still having backfire issues and I have approximately one, and one to two second delay on the throttle before there is any true power and acceleration. Remember, he has a delay on the, th on the throttle off of idle. That's, that's the key sentence of this whole thing. Mixers, are the mixers too lean? Carbs still dirty? I attempt the auto drop procedure that you described in your de deceleration backfire because you were describing my exact problem, which is having rough idle, backfire, and exhaust, and low power and acceleration. Any tips in the meantime, or should I wait for the new carb videos? Thanks, Cody. Um, so, you could still have dirty carbs, you could, but what I'm going to look and see right now is that the 85 VT700 uses what we call an accelerator pump. And let's see. I just Googled real quick 750 carbs. I'm trying to pull up an image. And let's see. It doesn't appear that it does. Let me check one more thing. The, the, the reason why I, I'm, I'm looking at that is because the, the accelerator pump has a lot to do with that initial throttle. I've never, we don't work on 700s, man. I mean, because usually it's just too expensive to work on them and people don't want to put a lot of money into those bikes. So we don't see a lot of them. But it looks like, let's see. Vapor hone. I don't, I don't see one. Okay, so we're going to say that it does not have one, um, which is totally fine. 
So that would lead me to think that uh, you have a transfer port in the body of the carb that's not perfectly clean. So if you look down the throat of a carb and slowly pull back the butterfly on it, you will be, like let's say here's the throttle bore, and you pull back the throttle on it and flatten it out. As you open it up, you're, you're gonna see a bunch of holes right that it's kind of uncovering. And those are all transfers. So it's saying, okay, so from here, here, here to here, it's transferring into different circuits and the air rushing through the carb is pulling that air and fuel, that more air or more fuel out of that circuit to allow it to have a clean and smooth transition. Um, I would say that you have something in along the lines of the slow, slow speed circuit still being too clogged. Um, or if you, you said you've already done the deceleration backfire um, tuning or the pilot drop procedure, which means that you've, if you obtain the highest idle in that mixture adjustment, that your mixture, I'm not sure where you set it at, you didn't say, but that you fed the idle at idle base, not throttle, is spot on with the richness of it or the mixture of it. So, did you say that you had any, had any mods? Let me see. Mods unknown. So if, you, if you're running stock exhaust, stock air filter, and you're having that issue, I would look into something is not not cleaned. Something is not right. Um, you can try shimming the main jet needles with a number four steel washer. You can literally just go to Amazon, type in number four wa uh, number four steel washer, and they're like a little pack of fifty. You can shim that needle with that, and that will richen up the mixture overall, from idle mid range to high to um, main wide open throttle. That will richen up all of that and make it all feel nice and cozy. Um, but also where the chokes, I, cause I, I did see on there that it's, it looks like it, the carburetors are a lot like the VT1100s. So they had like the same enrichener valves I was talking about. If you take those off and spray directly into there with the carbs off the bike and you can have the bowls off and look down inside, when you're spraying into there, you should see it coming out of somewhere either near the idle mixture, um, out of one of those transfer ports, idle mixture, slow speed, or the, or, or, or the main. Reclean them. I know you probably don't want to, but that's what I would suggest. If I had that issue, I would immediately think that there's something not clean in the slow speed circuits of that carb. Okay? And I would take the carbs back off, and I would readjust. Also, it is important to make sure that, you know, that the carb sink is good on on those as well because if you have if you have a crazy sink that's that's out by a lot like one's working way harder than the other it will have a lag um so making sure that you and i have a video on that as well on like the twin carb sink or something like that all right so i'm gonna pull up the last question and i didn't save it into my notes so i'm gonna go back to my email and uh I didn't tell you guys what I'm working on lately. So right now I'm working on, I'm still putting the ATC 200X back together, the motor. I'm rebuilding the motor on that. Um, smoked clutch, piston rings were worn out, smoked like a chimney. Uh, the exhaust valves were, no, the intake valves were worn out completely. Um, I'm working on a 94 750 from my buddy Ari. Shout out to Ari. And, uh, coffee and rye, but um, <laughs> inside joke. But he's, uh, he, he has pod filters on his carbs and I'm getting them tuned up right because his mid-range is junk. And uh, this one, the uh, Magna V65, um, doing the forks on it because he's complaining about the suspension being way too spongy, which they were. So I'm gonna go through and change out all the bushings inside and adding, I'm actually gonna go up in weight of the oil. Like I'm gonna, I think the stock is gonna be like SS8. So a, a Honda wants like a 10 weight. I'll probably put like a 15 bell ray in there and kind of stiffen up the rebound and compression on a little bit. That's what I do with all the 90s bikes is put a little bit heavier weight oil in them. Depending on which bike it is. Cause some don't dive as bad as this one does. But when you're breaking, it's kind of like, you're like Ugh. So we're gonna fix that up for him. Um, Yeah, the CT70 is still here because I'm um, trying to find some handlebars for it because he's got a bent one. And you wouldn't believe the amount of bent left handlebars 
are on eBay for sale for like 80 bucks. It's insane. It's bent handlebars. I, and that's me wrecking a bike and putting the handlebars up for sale on eBay. Say, hey, yeah, these are worth 80 bucks. But, you know, it is, you know, a retro bike and it's vintage and it's KO and it's all this garbage. But I'm replacing that on them. So the motor's done. I got a brand new tire. Yeah. See that? Isn't that beautiful? Brand new rim. You can get parts anywhere, man. I'll tell you what. But yeah, so still working on that. Um, but let me pull up this like I was gonna tell you, tell you guys what I'm gonna do. Um, let's see. Did I really delete it? It was about a C L. It was the grounding problem that I was gonna talk to you guys about. And I think I deleted it, man. Anyways, in the meantime, something you guys could be writing about is what kind of videos do you think you would like to see or something that you're struggling with on your own bike? Um, it can't be like crazy, crazy specific, like how to replace the cam chain on a CB550, you know, because I just don't have that motor laying around, but anything that you guys would like to see, um, maybe it if you did take part in the, in the membership course, like what kind of stuff would you guys like to see? Is it, is it electrical? Is it more carburation stuff? Is it just basic maintenance stuff? Is it, let me know. While I'm trying to find this, you guys can be uh, filling that out for me and we'll kind of go over that and see if it's something that is feasible because I really want to help you guys out. Um, I can't find it, man. Every time I add something to my notes, I delete it from my email thus never being able to find it again when I want to. So the question was about a, I think like a C, CL or SL or you know, CL125 or 175. And he put new handlebars on it, but it's horn button and his starter ignition stopped working. And the reason why I want to go over that because that's, those actually ground through the handlebar. Like when the manual tells you to start checking those switches out, they literally want you to put a test lead on the handlebar and the wire coming from the horn or vice versa. So my brother who put the handlebar, the new handlebars and fed the wires internally into the handlebar, make sure it's not painted. Um, make sure that your handlebars have, a, have continuity or a connection to ground. So touch the negative side of the battery and the handlebar with your meter leads and see if it has a connection to ground. If the handlebar is not grounded, then those switches won't work. Um, I can't find it. So, that sucks. All right, so that's all I have, man. Sorry, I couldn't remember that, that, that last one. I'm just under the weather, man. I'll tell you what, it's been nasty. It's supposed to be like 70 degrees on Sunday and then 43 degrees on Monday. It's ridiculous and it's cold and rainy and my throat hurts and I'm just whining. I'm whining to you guys right now. So, let's see what you guys have to say. That's it, that's, uh, that's all I have for questions right now. Um, <clears throat> let's see what's going on. All right. You can never have enough information. If anything, I'm really thankful for all your info and experience. Thanks, Vera. 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 007. Thanks, Eric. Uh, let's see. Wombat Moto, have you had any time to wrench on that 350? Not yet, dude. Dude, if I really want to, man. I actually have the motor right here. But t to be real with you, it's about to be lawnmower cutting season, and my 22-year-old HR215, which I love so dearly, smokes like a freaking chimney. And I have all the parts I need to rebuild that. I gotta put, I gotta, that's something that I need, you know what I mean? I mean, I can start it up and fire and it'll run all day long, even when it's smoking, but I smoke the entire neighborhood out. I just look like the, like, 
a bum pushing a mower in my front yard and just like billowing billowing out smoke and I'm the technician you know what I'm saying but so I, I, got, I, got, I got that to do um, I gotta put a clutch in the 450 it keeps it keeps um, the clutch keeps sticking and that's gonna be like my daily rider this summer but the, the 350 I have big plans for the 350 if any of you cafe guys out there or bobber or um, likes who like really good design and custom building stuff. Next year, I'm really, really trying to plan a trip to the One Moto Show out in Seattle. Um, and I'm planning on building that, that 350 to take with me there. Um, and I'm kind of partnering with a buddy on what kind of designs we're gonna do. He really wants to put like some kind of surf rack or longboard rack on that bike to make it kind of surfy. So I'm excited, it'll, it'll be some kind of 350 scrambler, but that's the, goal for that it all requires money man that's what building a bike requires is money if you if, if I want to do it well and that's what I want to do and I, I want all the all coolest stuff um, so and but you know YouTube is pretty much free land so that's where I spend most of my time um, Lion X, up Cody, I'm, I love how the bikes you work on are similar to mine with detailed steps. Awesome, man. Hopefully, I'm, try, I'm trying to spread spread the grease out far and get a lot more bikes. But it's winter time, guys, and I don't get that many. That's much stuff to work on. And if I do, do something to work on, it's like a big heavy hitter, like a motor rebuild or something like that. And I just want time. If I want to make money in the winter time, I, it, you guys got, got to realize that when I shoot a video. I'm shooting almost 45 minutes of content and then I crush it down to something that's like actually digestible. Um, so if I were to do like a video on a motor rebuild, that, that would require, you know, a couple of hours to do and I, I can't do it during work, you know, because I have to make money during work. Eventually, drum roll, I'll be buying a house with a garage and that, my friend, is where it will be pretty sweet because I can just record until freaking three in the morning. Until my wife comes and grabs my ear and takes me to bed, but um, that's why it's it, it's hard for me to put out content in the winter time because I'm just, there's just not too much everyday you know mundane stuff that I can say okay I can put that off and record that tonight so that's a little insider of of the of the ND space. Um, uh, meandering, show the bike off behind you. It's a gorgeous bike, dude. I, I think I've already shown it off a couple of times, but I mean, it is, mint is an understatement. I mean, this guy wants it to be perfect and he always brings it to me, which is really cool. I mean, we've had to put a, a, a fuel pump in it off of a Suzuki Marauder because it, you cannot find the fuel pumps for these anymore and there's a certain specific wiring that goes to that fuel pump and I found that the Suzuki Marauder fits perfectly. Um, but. It's a great bike, man. Really awesome power. The carbs are perfect. Um, but thoughts on it. He, Meandering also said, thoughts on a Shadow 750C2 on the highway. My, my beef with 750s is, I mean, I, they are phenomenal bikes. I mean, they are bulletproof as all get out, man. They are like the Honda Civic of the Honda motorcycle industry. Okay, they just, they are bulletproof. The charging systems are awesome. If you take care of them, they will surely take care of you for many, many miles. We, I've seen many 750s with over 100,000 miles on them. Taken care of right. And they're brought into the shop. We take care of them, you know, year after year, decade after decade. Um, or, you know, if you are well up on your maintenance and stuff like that. I, I'm not saying that you had to have a shop to do that. But my beef with them is the rear suspension. I am 155 pounds soaking wet. And I tend to get bucked around on those things. Um, and the seat is just, to me, it's god awful. You, you gotta spend, you know, eight hundred dollars on a, either a stiff, Corbin seat, or like the the Mustang seats, which which I do like with the backrest. I do like that, um, but the rear suspension, man, it's just so stiff. It's so stiff. Like as soon as you, as soon as you hit a bump, I I come off the rear end almost every time, and I I I had an 05, and that was my my biggest problem <clears throat> with those but other than that man I mean I would cruise at 75 80 on those things all day long and it may seem like you're wringing its neck but it's still there's still power for you to go more in those things so 
It's a great bike for the highway, I think. I think. I needed extenders on it. <clears throat> and my throat. <clears throat> Lion, what's up, Cody? Please do a tutorial on adjusting valves and changing shims on a 98 Nighthawk. Everyone wants to... Everyone wants to charge me over 1K. Man. Well, let me, let me tell you two things. If you're talking about the Nighthawk 750, you shouldn't have to adjust the valves on that. I mean, there is no valves to adjust. You have, you, the HVA system on a Nighthawk 750, that's what you're talking about. Not the 250 has a hydraulic valve adjusting system, okay? So, they automatically adjust. Now, there are shims for the HVAs, but that requires very, very precise dial indicator style stuff, and that's, should, I mean, unless you have a horrendous locked HVA, and it's just clacking like crazy, um, you should never need to go inside of there, man, for a very, 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 probably ever long time. Hydraulic valve adjustment system is very, very, it's an awesome operating system. Um, and if someone's trying to tell you that they can adjust your valves on a 98 Nighthawk 750, then they don't know what they're talking about. Because there's not just an, a, 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 like simple adjustments you can do. But $1,000, that's, I mean, that's where it kind of seems like they do because if you needed an adjustment, you would need, like I said, precision measuring tools to measure overlap and lift of that HVA and then shim that specifically. You really got to know what you're doing to do that. Anytime the HVA systems are taken out. Um, so that's that. So I probably, unfortunately, I probably won't do that because I probably never see it. All the content I get is solely based off of what comes through the door. And I try to make, you know, top list of what I should do. If something comes in, okay, I need to do that one. You know, so, um, moving on. New Shooter 6T4. I have an 03 Suzuki 250 with issues over revving. Over revving? Could the aftermarket exhaust cause, it, cause revving issues? No. It was on the bike when I bought it. I've tried cleaning the carbs, but may need to do it again. Excuse me, and replace the jets. No, the exhaust won't, won't do that. I, I don't really know what you mean by over revving issues. I'm thinking that maybe you're thinking, or maybe what's happening is you're revving the bike and all of a sudden it jumps up and just stays up there, even with the throttle, throttle depressed. I would double check to make sure that your butterfly is returning back to normal, that you have proper throttle cable free play. Um, because if you rev it up and, and that throttle is just being stuck there, then that's your problem. Or, I don't know how the Suzuki 250 operates as far as carburetors go, but visually inspect the throttle on that, man. Just make sure that it is returning back. Your idle's not set too high. That your, if it has twin carb, that it's, they're synced right. Because if you have a, a throttle put that, that, that's like this, it's going to idle high all, all day long. <sighs> Let's see, Luke Gundon, headlight is out. Tested the bulb for continuity, checked fuses. High beam indicator does not come on. Luke, what kind of bike do you have? Let's see, reading on, reading on, reading on. Thank you guys for hanging out thus far and not leaving me. You guys are awesome. Luke said 84 CB700S. Um, I, would, uh, I would look into the starter button system all right starter button system if the starter button cuts the headlight um like on the on the 750 nighthawk i had a headlight issue when i laid the bike down a year ago and the starter the wire for the headlight running through the starter because the, the starter button will cut the headlight to apply amperage to the coils and voltage to the coils and if that's broken, then the headlight won't work and the um, high beam indicator won't work either. So look into that, the wiring diagram, check the headlight wires through the starter button. Uh, 
see. Reading, reading, reading. Not a fast reader, man. Y'all y'all tearing this comment page up. That's awesome. Willie Mor Morell. I'm coming to Norfolk this weekend. Sweet. Dude, if you want to stop by the shop, man, I'll give you some stickers. Just come in and tell me who you are and remind me who you are. But, um, yeah, dude, look us up. Honda of Norfolk. I'll be there 9 to 5, Monday through Friday, and 9 to 3 on Saturday. It'll be awesome to meet you, man. What's going on, James Phelps? Ferris said anything related to the VT600 single carbs, because I just... That's what I just bought. I have a single carb video that I'm working on right now. It's not the exact 600 carb, um, but uh, the single carb is pretty much exactly the same for that model. So join the email mailing list, brother. You never know what you're gonna get. Uh, Mike. Hello, Cody with an I. CBR 900, 95 Honda. Noises by timing tensioner noise goes away when I pull my clutch. Please help. Man, I've heard more issues with that. Um, a lot, a lot of the CBRs have a sound like that when you pull the clutch in. And uh, the only thing that I can relate that to, because I've never found a fix for that, um, nor have I been told that it's an actual issue, okay? But... On the CBR 1000 and the 600RR, at one year they had a recall on the crankshaft because when you would pull the clutch in, or the noise was there when the clutch was out, when you pull the clutch in, shift it in the gear, and then hold the front brake and slowly let the clutch out, it would make like a clacking noise. And that was a direct connection to a badly machined crankshaft um, on the clutch hub, the two gears that meet they were causing excessive noise um but honestly i've seen a lot of cbrs make that crazy noise um and a lot of them come brand new i've, I've heard new i've seen new cbrs come and when you it's, I mean, it's not like very very dis, like distinct and you can point it out exactly where it's at but that's a tough one um i would make sure that it's not tension or noise for sure um, but you you could have a crankshaft problem. Not to like jump right into deep water with that, but I don't want to just say, yeah, you have a bad crankshaft. Um, let's see, we'll wrap this up here in a minute, guys. I see some guys, people dropping out. Um, Z, what are you doing, man? Over there eating coin or something. We're gonna sit. Hey, lay down, lay down, lay down. Okay, don't listen. Any problems with the 83 Honda Shadow 750? It's old. Um, that's, that's one of the problems with them, that they're getting older and you can't get stock parts for them and the charging systems are um, subpar. I mean, you gotta think that's almost, almost 30 something years old, man. I'm not saying that they're not worth it, but if they're in great shape like this one, then it's it's a go, but a lot of them are just botched, left outside, uh, hardwired. People try to do custom stuff, and then they never finish it, and then they're just junk. But they're just getting old, man, and Honda's, Honda's not... They don't have to make parts past 10 years. They do, but they're not, like, obligated to make parts past 10 years. That's it. There's some Nighthawk stuff I can't even get, and it pisses me off, but it's just old. And they only made certain bikes, in the 80s, they only made certain bikes for certain years, and a lot of companies won't repop the parts because it's just not lucrative. I mean, it, they, made a, they made one bike for 83, 84, and then that was it. They're not gonna make 5,000 of these parts because it's just so, it's, it's a small niche. They want bikes that are from 91 to 03, you know what I mean? So, it's hard to find repop stuff for them. You gotta just make it work. Um, <laughs> Michael said, love you, man. 
Sweet, dude. Love you too, bro. Ninety-eight Magnus Seven Fifty blinkers do not work. When you try the amber right, the amber lights, the amber running lights just turn off, but no blinker. Okay, you can first you can try swapping the bulbs out. I imagine that you're saying that they don't work on both sides, so that would completely negate the, what I just said. Um, I don't know if you've seen my turn signal switch cleaning video. Look at this dog, man. He's just begging. Just begging, always begging. But I, I have a turn signal switch cleaning video that shows you how to clean that up and that might solve your problem. Um, have you thought about going to the hand-built show in Austin? I've never heard of it until just now. So I'll look into that. Um, let's see, we'll, we'll hit one more. Uh, Ah, oh, wait, I gotta watch the old news. <laughs> uh, let's see. Kyle, what do you think about LED bulbs that fit into older style sockets? Is it worth it to convert the system over to LED with the built-in resistors? If you can do it right, man, I, th I think it's worth it. I mean, I'm trying to convert the 450 over into some LED stuff, like the, uh, running, like the uh, tack lights and stuff like that. I think it's worth it. I mean, I think it's less strain on the charging system, personally because it uses such a small amount of voltage to make them work. Um, but if you just get a, a quality quality connector, make sure you use dielectric grease inside of that socket. Um, I think you, I, I think it's a great idea. The, the, my one issue with LEDs is they're hard to see during the day, but they're, they're wicked at night, you know? So during the day, you know, brake lights or LED brake lights and stuff like that may not be seen very well. Um, but again, at night, they are just as bright as ever. Kerry Aachen just came out with some stellar, stellar LED stuff, man. They came and showed us some stuff uh, on this little, like, tripod of, like, 20 different lights. They had lights, I kid you not, they are this big, and they will blind you. They will blind you. Um, Kerry Aachen, okay? I'm sure you guys have heard of that brand for some chrome stuff. They got some killer LED systems that, that, that don't require resistors and stuff like that. If you can get away from doing resistors, I would. I would try to look for like an LED relay or something like that. Because um, resistors just require you to solder or uh, make connections and possibly cause problems. And you got the wrong resistors and then it's just too slow and then it's too fast. I would just hook up some something that's meant for LED stuff um, and go with that. Eric Johnson, left a question on your YouTube comments. I have a video, need your opinion on, that's why it's running lean, California model, oh. VT750C2, that just installed hypercharger and Vanton Heinz cruiser exhaust. I turned the pilot jet two and a half times and replaced jet from 22 to 45. 22? What jet are you talking about? Maybe emissions control. There are no jets that are 22s. Wait, are there? A stock 22? I mean, ruckus carbs don't even use 20. They use 32. I've never heard of a 22. Main jet? No. Uh-uh. It's, it's, it's got to be like 122 or something like that. They use, it's not going to be 20. Regardless. You open it up from a, either a 122 to a 145. Um, no, the main jet's going to be large. It's, you're, 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 you're talking idle jet sizes right now. 32, 22, 45. Um, so no, not knowing which jet you... I, I'm hoping that you, you change the one on the emulsion tube. Not the single jet. So you got... Let me see. Z! Go here, boy. Last thing, and I'll, and I'll wrap this up. My throat's killing me. <clears throat> so you got an emulsion tube, right? And a main jet on top. And then you have an idle jet like this, okay? This is off of a 70s bike, but same exact difference. 
So this should not be that size. It, it, it's gonna be, I mean, like this one right here is a 120, you know? And it, I mean, it's huge. So this is a 40 idle jet. Um, so it sounds like you did a huge step up if you increase the main jet from a 20 to, to a 45, that's almost, I, I can't count right now. 20, 33, 22. It's almost 23 sizes up. That's a humongous jump. Um, so, I would never ever do that for a hypercharger system or an aftermarket exhaust. Not unless you're running straight pod filters on a, on a carb setup, but would I ever jump 22 sizes or 23 whatever sizes? You should be able to run a hypercharger with, with, with aftermarket exhaust with maybe going five up, 10 up on the main jet with a shim underneath the main jet needle and a, I would go three turns out on the mixture screws and it run like, and it run great. But, um, yeah. So a little bit, a, a little bit of confusion. Maybe shoot a, a, another email with, um, on my email, not on YouTube, because the questions that you guys leave on YouTube, they just get lost. And I don't have time to like check every single one because they just, they just pile up. That's why I designed the Ask MD thing on my website, MotorcycleMD.com, where I'll actually, because I, 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 I read every email, eventually. I flag some and to come back later because they're like super involved. But email me with more information, man, maybe some pictures. I'll check that video out and I'll look into it. Um, I think there's one more. The, Farrah, the type of grease I'm talking about is uh, di, dielectric, di, di, dielectric grease. It's like clear. You can buy it at the auto parts store. Um, it's meant to just keep moisture out, okay? Keyword, guys, keyword with dielectric grease. It's a very misused product. Dielectric grease is not meant to go inside of a connector and then you slam the connector together and now it's just like watertight. That's not what it's meant for. Dielectric grease is meant to go around the connector and then you connect it, not fill up the freaking male ends and then slam that connector into each other because that, 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 that can cause, it puts, clearance between those two so if i have a blade I, i'm i'm ranting again if i have a female or a male blade and i fit a male blade in, inside of it okay and i pack this full of dielectric grease it's now going to sit like this because there's so much packed in there and that causes high resistance and that burns up connectors so that's that i'm going to end there okay i've i have crushed some time w w with you guys thank you guys so much for being involved and just engaging with me. I love motorcycles. I know you guys do too. So I, I really appreciate you guys hanging out with me, asking me questions and um, listening to my raspy voice. So you guys are huge encouragement. Thank you guys for purchasing shirts. I have a lot of mediums left that I'm trying to get rid of. If you guys want to get a, a, a motorcycle MD shirt, hit me up on the website. Um, I'll be doing some giveaways here soon. Um, from Gloveworks HD, they sent me some awesome gloves that I want to give away to you guys. So keep in keep in touch with me on that on the email list. Join me on Instagram, the Motorcycle MD. Um, I do lots of cool, interesting stuff on there that I won't necessarily post on YouTube. And uh, be looking out, man, for this membership course coming out. Um, it's going to be super exclusive. Uh, a lot of premium, premium content that you guys may not see here on the YouTube page. So just keep in touch with me. I can't wait to just give even even more value to you guys th through that way as well as finally put these card videos out for you guys to watch. So <clears throat> again, thank you so much for hanging out with me tonight. I'll see you guys possibly next Monday for the next edition of Live Q&A. If you have any questions, this whole thing is based off of the questions that you ask, go to the website, ask MD, hit me up. I'd love to help, help you guys out, hopefully. Um, and that's it. You guys ride safe. Keep wrenching. Um, thank you so much for hanging out with me. I'll see you guys very soon.
Cody from Earn Second Lend D. I'm out.